Well, the title of my message this morning is Jehovah Jireh. It is the, the Lord will provide. If you've heard the name Jehovah before, you know that's, that is the name for God, and Jireh means the Lord will provide. And this is the first of, of um, several messages focusing on the names of God that I've pre been preparing for um, this summer as I go off to preach at Trinity Community Church down in Sea Isle City. Uh, Trinity Community Church of Sea Isle is a church where I've been handling the, the leadership and, and preaching duties for 11 summers now. Some of you have, have been there and we're, we're grateful for your presence. This summer will be our 12th season in uh, Sea Isle City and we're, we're grateful for the, the joy that we have there. Some folks call it Joy South because we, you know, we take you know, what we've learned here and, and share, it, share the good news of the Lord down there. Um, if you've been here before, you've heard about my role there, and I'm, I'm grateful for your support. Um, and that's also why within that role, in just a few weeks, um, we'll disappear for 11 Sundays in a row. You won't see us for a while, but uh, we're grateful to God. And for those of you uh, who are new, uh, Trinity Community Church is located at 85th and Landis in uh, Sea Isle City. If you know um, anything about Sea Isle City, it's down in the Townsend's Inlet section. And if you're old, you know that it's about a block from where bushes used to be. Uh, the she crab soup was just amazing, but um, that's been gone for some years. But as you can imagine, you know, pastoring a church a block from the beach, it's tough duty, but somebody's got to do it. So I, I have uh, I have joy. Um, Andre and I are blessed beyond words, really, to be able to minister uh, at this little church every summer. And uh, God has given us uh, new friendships and, and lots of new, new ways of, of meeting others and sharing the truth. And it's just a ton of fun. Uh, Trinity, by the way, is a non-denominational church. We sing this thing called hymns. You might remember those out of a hymn book. Um, and we pray together, we share the word, and we just have a have a great time uh, every week in, in the Lord. We would love to have you there. We're only open for 11 weeks. We start the last Sunday in June, go through Labor Day weekend. Um, there, are just, there aren't enough people in Seattle City to sustain a little church like that uh, through the, you know, what we call the off-season. Uh, but we're glad to be there. Each week uh, at, at Trinity, we have a few regulars, um, half a dozen folks that, that uh, some are there you know, every year, or a couple of people that actually live there year-round. And then uh, we have mostly vacationers. We actually ring the church bell in the steeple and invite the neighborhood in, and, and they come. And uh, we're glad to be together with them, as, even as they, they worship while they're away from home. Uh, this summer, Trinity Community Church will celebrate its 98th uh, anniversary, 98 years of faithful service to the Lord. And we're, we're grateful to be a, a part of that. Uh, I was doing a little research over the over, you know, last few days, and it looks like I am the longest serving pastor there in 98 years, <laughs> so, yeah, no, no applause. Thank you, but uh, it's just a, a ton of fun. And now, one question that gets asked of us uh, every year is, so, do you get to spend the whole summer at the shore? No. <laughs> Sadly, we're, we're, we're still here. Um, my day job as the CEO of Options for Women and, and Andrea's job as a, um, she's a practice transformation specialist. I dare you to ask her what that means after the service this morning. Um, so our jobs bring us back here for the week and then we head down there for the weekends and uh, just love being there. So if you're going on vacation at the shore this summer, no excuses. <laughs> There's a place for you to worship in Seattle City. It's only 10 minutes from Ocean City. It's only about 20 minutes from the Wildwoods, and so we would love to have you if you're there. Um, all the information you need about the church is on our Facebook page. It's called Trinity Community Church of Seattle City. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Just remember, when you go on vacation, don't take a vacation from God. Okay, is that a meme or, or is that a meme? Okay, so there. Hey, that's great. So thank you. Thanks for letting me share that. I just uh, wanted you to know you know, how things are going in our 12th year. We're really excited. Um, our, our social media, by the way, down for the Trinity Church has blown up. We have three times more people on our social media than we had a, a year ago today. So we're thinking that, you know, folks are going to be really coming to the church this, this summer. So if you would pray. All right, let's talk about Jehovah Jireh. 
Did you know that there are 21 names associated with God in the Scripture? And 21 names that have different attributes attached to God. So God this and God that. And the one we're talking about this morning is Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. So this morning, um, in my, um, uh, my message, I just want to, want to talk to you about how God provides for us, how God looks after us, how he, how he precedes us in life, and how he walks with us um, in so many different ways. So let me give you a little, little example of what it means to have a God who provides uh, I remember when I was a child and, and still in school, I grew up in Haddon Heights, not, not too far from here. And uh, my parents at the beginning of the school year would, would take us uptown to what was called the, the five and 10. If you've been around here for a while, you remember the five and 10 is where the karate school is now. Um, this was my favorite time of year because it was one of, the, one of the few times we were really poor. <laughs> How poor were we? No. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, and going to the, to the store to buy brand new notebooks and pens and pencils and all that sort of thing was, was just great. And we would go from row to row in the store, picking out the supplies that we needed and, you know, and, and being able to you know, take those home and, and be ready for, uh, for, the, for the school year. You know, pencils and paper and folders and, and notebooks. But you know what? When I was at that, that age, no matter what choice I made, I wasn't considering the cost of all the things that I had, I had put in my little bag. I just knew that I needed them. And I put them in the bag, and then we went up to the, to the front counter where mom and dad paid for all of the supplies that I need. With every choice that I made, I didn't consider if my parents could afford the, I don't know, dollar and something that it probably cost in, in those days um, to, to buy all the school supplies. My job was to pick out the things that I needed. Their job was to provide for my needs, was to, was to help me. Um, and and I, I didn't worry about how they would pay for them. I just knew that they would. We went to the store. So you see, our parents were the providers. They were the ones who took care of our needs and, and helped us out uh, with all the things. It was their responsibility to provide for our needs. They did this in, in this situation, but also on a daily basis, regardless of whether I felt like they could provide for my need. They took care of my daily needs. I had a place, so a roof over my head. We had food in the kitchen. You know, there were all, all the things that I needed were taken care of, regardless of what I considered their ability to pay. Because we were children, I, you know, I, I saw this as the ability to, to live in this world and not have to worry about these things. I know there are some you know, who grow up and have, you know, really challenging circumstances, but I, for one, knew that, that God, well, my parents would provide. Well, you know, as a Christian, we have the same res uh, relationship with our Heavenly Father. He knows what we need, and we don't worry about God's ability to take care of our needs, do we? We know that, you know, He's going to provide for the things that, that we need. He chose us as His own, and he takes on the responsibility to provide for all the things that, that uh, we need every, every day. So in this role, God is Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. So let's talk about both aspects of that name. Let's talk about the Jehovah part first. You know, of, the, of the 21 names that are assigned to God based on his, the attributes that he has, 10 of those include the name Jehovah. If you come down to Trinity this summer, you'll hear about all, all 11 names of, of uh, God, Jehovah. Hint, hint. <laughs> so I want to briefly review what this name means, just so you understand the, the root meaning of the name. The name Jehovah actually means I am. Now, you've heard that before from this pulpit and others. You've read it in Scripture. And it speaks to the fact that God has always been and he always will be. He is just eternally existent as God. He doesn't change. His promises never fail. And this name was, was given based on, um, on Moses' interactions with God, where God was explaining to Moses who he was. You remember that, that interaction? 
God first called Moses to go deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. You've all heard that story, you know, all this stuff around, you know, Moses and the, the Red Sea parting and then walking for, you know, all that time in the desert. When Moses and God actually, you know, were, were present with each other, there was this discussion. And Moses was fearful. And he asked God how he should answer the people when they asked him, what was the name of God? This God that he had encountered. And God responded by saying to Moses, tell them, I am who I am. That sound like an answer? Well, it, it means everything to God, and it meant everything to Moses. He said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, they understood what I am meant. And the key to understanding all of God's names is to start with the knowledge that God is the I am. Eternally existent from the beginning, eternally existent forever from now on. Now, why is it important that we remember this? Well, when I go somewhere and I meet someone new, and I do that a lot in my role at, at uh, Options, I tell them, I'm Chuck Swanson. That doesn't have the same impact as God saying to Moses, I am. It's not exactly the same. Pretty close, but not, not really that, that much. This tells them nothing about me, unless they've heard about me before. And I guess a lot of the time they go, ew, really? <laughs> but those, no, hopefully they, they say, oh, you're Chuck Swanson. Uh, this tells them how they should refer to me. Uh, not so much that you know, I'm anyone in particular, but when they address me, when we have a conversation, they, they know to call me Chuck. This tells them uh, enough that we can have this conversation, but this is not the case with God. God said that he was, I am, period. That's all he had to say about who he is and what his name was, so that we understand this is the eternally existent one. He is the I am. He exists within himself and always has been. You know, I, I think about these concepts sometimes like time, eternally existent. You know, and the, and the world kind of says to us sometimes, well, who made God? Well, God just has always existed, and he is the I am, and he tells us that in Scripture. I accept it as the truth because I, I have had a relationship with Jesus Christ since I was 15, so I have a relationship with the Father as well. So as we move through the names of God, you know, think, I think about this I am as being something really special. Whenever you hear the, the, one of the God's names beginning with Jehovah, just know that he's saying, I'm, I'm just saying again my name, I am, and telling you about who I am. Uh, so we're going to begin with Jehovah Jireh this morning. So I want to, want to share with you what, that, what, Jai, what now Jehovah Jireh means. So as you, as you think on the name Jehovah Jireh, consider that phrase, I am Jehovah. And now we can add this attribute, Jira. I am Jira. I am the one who provides. This name originated with a guy named Abraham. I'm sure you've heard of that, uh, heard of him. Well, Abraham didn't exactly assign this name to God. There's a story about how it all evolved. He named the place where he was to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice with this name. Remember the, the story of Abraham and Isaac, they had to go up on the mountain. Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac. Oh, I won't give it away, in case you haven't heard. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. But Abraham attached this name to the place because God provided, because God you know, used Abraham and Isaac to tell an important message. So I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bible with you, turn with me, or okay, if it's on your phone, or on a tablet, uh, or in your Bible, uh, you know, an actual written, you know, pages and stuff, you remember those. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to begin looking uh, at, at verse 7. Now, as you look, uh, this, in this chapter, Abraham uh, was tested by God, and there's a, a great story that we'll, we'll talk about. 
He was tested by God. And I don't understand the mind of God when he, when he chose to do what he did. I mean, how, how did he work all of this out in advance? You know, but he chose to find out if Abraham valued him above everything else. Did Abraham really love God? And was he able to, to put that love for him and his faith in God into action as, as, he was, as he was being called to? In the story, you remember God told Abraham to take his son Isaac, who was the one that he loved, to the land of Moriah and, and to offer him up as, a, as an offering, and literally as a burnt offering to God. Now, Abraham didn't, didn't complain he didn't whine or question what God had him about to do. He just did as he was told. You know, take Isaac up on, on the mountain and, and I'll share some things with you. As they arrived at the place where he was to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, I mean, imagine this, having your child and God saying, we're gonna, we're gonna sacrifice him. I just can't imagine. As they arrived at this place where he was to offer Isaac, Isaac noticed that Abraham had everything that he needed for the burnt offering, except one thing, the offering. What was it that he was going to put on the fire to offer to God? So let's begin reading at verse 7. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. And Abraham said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. This isn't looking really good for Isaac, is it? Imagine, you know, here you have this fire thing that, that your father has built, and then your father says, climb on. Oh my. Then Abraham reached out his hand, and he took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. Imagine you're Isaac. Ah. <laughs> For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and, and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. I have to wonder, if I were in a position like this, how would I respond to God asking me for that kind of sacrifice? A child. Maybe he'd want me to give up my home or my beloved car. <laughs> Some special thing to me. How would, how would I respond in faith? Abraham did exactly as he was told. I mean, to the point of having the knife and probably having it ready to stab his own son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Jira. And as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. I want to point out a, a few things before we judge God or Abraham too harshly because of this situation. First, God, he knew Abraham's heart, and he didn't really have to test him, did he? Did, did God have to, you know, have Abraham go through all this to see what kind of faith he had? Do you think God already knew? I think he did. Second, Abraham knew God, and he knew that he could trust God in whatever ha would happen next, that God would provide for whatever happened. And now you see, Abraham knew that based on what God had promised to him, that Isaac would not be dead on that mountain. When Abraham was 75 years old, 
God told him to leave his father's house and go where he would tell him to go. That's back in Genesis chapter 12, if you want to look at that later. When God called Abraham to leave his family, he promised him that he would give him a lot of descendants. Anybody remember how many descendants he said that Abraham would give? As many as the stars in the sky. And those descendants would come through Isaac. Okay, so God made that promise earlier before Isaac was even born. Do you think God keeps his promises? Can I have an amen? Amen. So let's turn to, again in Scripture and take another look at another pa- passage. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, and I'm going to ask you to turn to, uh, to verse 5. This is Genesis chapter 15. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. And let's turn to verse, verse 5 of chapter 15. It says, and he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars. God is talking to Abraham here. If you are, if you are able to count them, have you ever, now here in, in New Jersey, if you look at the, the sky at night, even on a really clear night, you can see a good number of the stars. Have you ever been to like to Canada <laughs> or someplace in the, in the Rocky Mountains or something where, there, where there's no light from the big cities and you can really see the stars? It's so different from what we see here. I mean, it's literally, it really bathes the sky with all of the stars that you can see. And this is what Abraham must have seen out in the desert or up on the mountain. He says, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. That's a great promise. And God said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. What do you think he's talking about? Yep, we'll get there. Where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch was which passed between these places. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, which was his name before he became Abraham, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Wow. Pretty cool promise from God. And do we know that he kept it? He did. Before God could fulfill this promise, though Sarah... Abraham's wife became impatient and gave her handmaid Hagar to Abraham to bear a child uh, for him in her stead. And Abraham produced his firstborn son through Hagar. But he was not um, the firstborn son of promise. He was the firstborn son that came through Sarah's disobedience. So the, the world, some you know, 4,000 plus years later, is still dealing with the results of Sarah's disobedience. You know that? That's another sermon. As these two nations continue to war against each other, even today, you know, we're talking about Christianity and Islam. Isaac was the son of Abraham, and Sarah said it was through his bloodline that God would fulfill the promise. Genesis 21, verse 12 records, But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. So when you study these verses, you'll conclude that Abraham had nothing to lose by going to the mountaintop and beginning the sacrifice of Isaac. Abraham knew that because God had made a covenant with him, Isaac would come back down that mountain with him. He would be alive and he would be well. Whether he offered Isaac as a sacrifice and God restored him to life, or just protected him from sacrifice at all, he knew that he could trust the promise of God, that God would do as he said he would, and, 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 and that his lineage would come through Isaac. Abraham knew that Isaac would leave that mountain with him to fulfill the promise that God had made to him about his life. There was no doubt in Abraham's mind, I think, that he knew what God was looking to do. And why was he so sure about this, do you think? Have you ever been to that point where you just absolutely knew God was going to work with you, was going to help you? God had made a promise to him, and God 
never goes back on his promises, does he? No, not ever. So when Isaac asked Abraham about the lamb, Abraham responded by faith that God would provide for him himself, and there would be a lamb for the sacrifice. The Apostle Paul speaks of this in, in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, where he writes, by faith, Abraham, there's a whole chapter about people of faith, by the way, it's really worth reading when you have a minute. By faith, Abraham, in this case, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. And he considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And Abraham, Abraham knew for certain that Isaac would live because God would fulfill his promise through him. So when Isaac asked about the lamb for the sacrifice, there was really only one answer that Abraham could give, and that was that God would provide because Abraham did not bring an extra one with him. He knew what the promise was, and he trusted God. As far as he was concerned, his job was to sacrifice Isaac, and then God would do what God would do. Also, if God changed his mind once they got there, then God would provide his own lamb for the sacrifice. Okay. Well, now let's talk about Jehovah and Jireh together. Jehovah Jireh. God made this promise to Abraham about his descendants when Abraham was 75 years old. I'm 65. 75 looks really old. <laughs> I'm not going to go there this morning because um, that's 10 years from now for me. And I, I know when I'm 75, I'll think that 85 is really old. And I'll keep pushing that out further and further the longer I live. Now we know that it was another 25 years before the promise was fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. So he was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And then Abraham lived another 75 years after that. At the time of his death, Isaac was 75 and had been married to Rebekah for 35 years. Isaac and Rebekah at the time of Abraham's death had two boys, Jacob and Esau, who served as the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Abraham did not live to see the promise totally fulfilled as it related to his descendants, but maybe from a, you know, his place worshiping God in heaven, Maybe that's, maybe that's a little more important than understanding your, the legacy you left behind on the earth. But he knew. He knew what God would do because of what he had said. And it says it was counted to him as righteousness. My point in sharing this with you is that God, like he provided for Abraham and Isaac, provides for you and me in the same way. Even though some of the things he has provided for us you know, won't be seen right away, and some of the plans that God has for us are in the future, we can know that he's with us. Our descendants, if we have faith, will be blessed in much the same way, and they will reap the benefit of God's provision for us because we are faithful to him. Let that sink in for a moment. If we're faithful to God, our children may see the provision of God or their children or their children after that. So now, speaking of promises, I think one of my favorite things in Scripture is Psalm 23. The first verse says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jehovah Jireh, I have the God who provides, David says. So after making that declaration, David spent the rest of the psalm, Psalm 23, discussing what it was that God did for him that made him come to that conclusion. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Ever walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I know you have. You've had times in your life when it just seemed like all around you was darkness, but God provided, didn't he? He brought you out of that darkness and into the light. So it is that David was able to proclaim God's goodness in the 23rd Psalm. Everything that he talks about can be summed up in this name for God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. 
Everyone who comes to the Lord will be provided for. That's what it means for us. God has never promised us, however, to give us what we want in every situation. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Give us this day our daily bread. He doesn't say, give us this day bread for the next six months. <sighs> give us, you know, enough you know, food in our pantry to, to cover us for the next three years. Give us this day our daily bread. And that's what Jesus taught the disciples to pray. And so we too can pray in the same way. And while God doesn't give us everything we need in every situation, he does give us everything that we need. So when we're asked, how will you do this or that, we can truth, truthfully answer, Jehovah Jireh, or I am, will provide. When our minds are so preoccupied with what's going on around us that we cannot rest, we can call on Jehovah Jireh, and he will provide us with the peace of mind that we need as we begin to focus on him. You know, there are times when I've been driving down the road and I, oops, I look at the gas gauge, and it's going down and down and down, and I know I don't have a lot of gas left in the gas tank. I've been in a lot of situations like that. I had to drive a lot in, in my earlier days working, and, and there were times when I may have miscalculated in my driving how far I could go before the gas got too low in the gas tank. And this is when you call on Jehovah Jireh to show you where there's a place to find fuel for your car. Now, you might be old enough to remember those days when you couldn't, you know, pick up your phone and go, hey Siri, <laughs> you know, show me the nearest gas station. And you had to, you know, sort of find it on your own. Remember those days? Well, I just, I knew that, you know, that I had to find gas, but there was this thing inside of me that said, well, if you drive a little bit more slowly, your gas will last a little longer and you can get to the gas station. Maybe that's a way that God provides for us as well, by giving us common sense and, and the things that we need every day. Um, to, to help us get through our lives. Sometimes in, in his role as Jehovah Jireh, he does call on us to, to use the, the things that he's taught us, the way we've been taught and we've grown up. I could go on and on about what God provides for us, but I think you already know about how God provides, don't you? How God has been watching out for you and, and going ahead of you in all your lives. But there's one point I want to leave you with this morning as it relates to Jehovah Jireh. When we think of God as our Jehovah Jireh, we often focus on the material things. He'll provide the car that I need when mine breaks down. He'll provide you know, gas to get me to my destination. He'll provide my family with food to get us through the, the days ahead. We think about those things to exist in our lives. Do we think so much about the emotional and mental and spiritual things that we need as we look to God? I don't think we always look for, about the health of our bodies or the clarity of our mind that we need to function on a daily basis. And there too, God says he will provide. And here again too, we don't think about the salvation that we need to have an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't think about the way that God provided his only son as a sacrifice for our sin. We don't think about the sanctification that was, that was provided to us in, in that process of making us righteous and calling out um, uh, us versus our being dirty and being left out of an eternal thing with, with God. We don't think about the thousands of times when we have called on him and shared our deepest secrets and longings and desires with him, and he provided a listening ear and gentle guidance for our lives. So as I finish here today, I want you to really think about all of the things that God has provided for you. When you go home, you're sitting, just pondering the mysteries of the universe today, think about how God has blessed you on a daily basis with everything that you need. Not every situation, not every want, but every need has been provided for you. And then say out loud, thank you God, for being my Jehovah Jireh. When God provides in that way, tell him how much you love him and thank him for being Jehovah 
Jireh, the one who provides. When you wake up in the morning, say that I am will provide for me today. Friends, may God bless you and, and keep you and help you to understand Jehovah Jireh in your life. Let's pray.